Now, without further ado, we would like to invite Mr. Scully to the stage. Please welcome Mr. Scully with a big applause. In 1960, President John F. Kennedy said to the world, within the decade, we will place a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. And in 1969, the first Apollo rocket placed a man on the moon and returned him safely to Earth. And that is known as the moonshot. And it wasn't just a moonshot because we got to the moon. It was a moonshot because at the time that President Kennedy made that statement in 1960, the technology did not exist to be able to return the astronaut back to Earth. It required digital telemetry. In Silicon Valley, we have been inspired for decades by the word moonshot. It means an innovation that is of such impact that after it occurs, the world is never again the same. And what I would like to share with you this morning is to go back to the early days of Silicon Valley, back when Steve Jobs and I worked together. And as Makimo san said in his remarks earlier this morning, Steve Jobs had this idea of his own moonshot. And his moonshot was the bicycle for the mine. I remember the first time that I was together with Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. It was late at night in the Macintosh engineering laboratory. This was over a year before the Macintosh was a real product. It was still in development. And Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were talking about this idea of what they referred to as their noble cause. It was one of the few times that Steve Jobs and Bill Gates actually agreed 100% on something, and it was the noble cause. Steve called it a bicycle for the mine. Bill Gates called it a tool for the mine. But it was all about empowering knowledge workers with the productivity so that individuals would be able to do things they never could have done before and to change the world one person at a time. When I joined Steve, he said, I've got this vision of the bicycle for the mine, but I'm the only one that seems to be interested in it. Because Steve said, I want my bicycle for the mine to be for creative people, not business people, not technical people. He said, I want to create a bicycle for the mine that non-technical people can use, and they can use this bicycle for the mine to do creative things. He said, I want you to teach me how to do the marketing that will excite the world about the product that Steve Jobs was creating, which was the Macintosh. And this is back when Steve was 26 years old. So we were all young back in those days. And when Steve introduced the first Macintosh in January of 1984, we launched it at the Super Bowl. And it was the first time that a personal computer had been positioned as a creative tool with graphics on the screen and a mouse and uh, the ability to do amazing things like desktop publishing. Many people have asked what it was like to work with this extraordinary visionary, Steve Jobs. And when did he come up with you know, some of his really disruptive, innovative ideas? It might surprise you to see this prototype of a Mac phone that Steve designed back in 1985. Now, it wasn't possible to build a product like this. So we could only make a reference model of what a phone that incorporated a tool, a bicycle for the mine, in it might look like. And this actually is the original model that we built. And you can see 
Steve's signature on it, SJ, and my signature on it, JS. But Moore's Law was this exponential growth that has propelled the computer industry for over 42 years. And even in 1993, after having been CEO for Apple of 10 years, we had some ideas of where technology would take us with bicycles for the mind. But it was still early days. Technology still, because of Moore's Law, was not powerful enough to do everything. But a few things did start, even as far back as 1993. One was this concept of personal digital assistant. Very similar to what <coughs> we're seeing today with Hue, except with a very primitive stage of technology. The Newton was the first digital assistant that actually could do tasks like schedule and um, enable the computer to be not just a tool, but to be an assistant. The ARM processor was actually co-developed by Apple and Professor Herman Hauser from Cambridge University. Apple owned 43% of the ARM computer, and the whole technology was optimized up at the MIT uh, campus where we had our uh, Newton Labs, one Kendall Square, and <coughs> it was optimized around the Newton. The Newton did not succeed commercially. The handwriting on it didn't really work. People made fun of it at the time. But the reality is that the ARM processor, which was developed for the, for the Newton, uh, today is in every mobile device that we have. And as you all know, here in Japan, uh, Masa Sun just acquired the ARM company just a few weeks ago for $32 billion. So the profitability of Newton, even though it was uh, back in the early days, it didn't succeed on its own as a commercial product. It was one of the most profitable products that Apple ever created. Let me talk about a new moonshot, a moonshot of today, a moonshot that is not a prediction of the future, but a moonshot that has already occurred. And this moonshot is about a market power shift that has enabled customers to be in control. And what that means is that the exponential growth of cloud, of data analytics, of mobility, has shifted the power from even the most established enterprises with great reputations, has shifted the power in the marketplace to the customers. And now customers are paying more attention to the opinions of other users, of other customers, than even many of the most famous established organizations. And that helps explain why you see companies like Google and Apple and Facebook and Amazon, Twitter, Alibaba, Line, WeChat, Snapchat, and there are many, many others who many of them don't even do any advertising. But the word of mouth with customers listening to the opinions of other customers, it becomes virtual. And many of these companies in just a few years have become world leading corporations. And so this is all about the exponential power of these technologies. A context that helped me understand how Steve Jobs thought as a disruptive innovator was what he used to call zooming. And Steve Jobs and I would walk on the Stanford University campus. We would go up in the hills above Silicon Valley. We'd walk around the buildings at Apple because Steve liked to spend more time walking and talking and thinking about things than actually sitting behind a desk in an office. And he called this concept zooming. And Steve used to say, we've got to zoom out We've got to pull back. We've got to look not just what the computer industry was in Silicon Valley back in the early 1980s. We've got to look at other industries, other things that are going on, because 
This bicycle for the mind is going to touch everything ultimately. And then he had a very Zen idea, Zen perspective of the world. And he said, simplification is the ultimate sophistication. An idea which I know you understand extremely well culturally here in Japan. So after Steve would zoom out and try to connect the dots between different things that may have gone beyond of what we thought of as high technology, then he would zoom in and simplify, and it was always about the experience of the user. Remember, he was trying to sell his products primarily to non-technical people. Let me give you an example of how powerful zooming is as a way of thinking about strategy. In the year 2007, Kodak was one of the most successful photography companies, along with Fuji. And Kodak was in a marketing war with Walmart in the United States. Walmart had introduced their own single-use point-and-click film camera, and it was taking market share away from Kodak. And Kodak said, we've got to double down our investment into film processing so we have more flexibility in pricing our single-use camera versus Walmart. Now, Kodak had a lot of very smart people in their company. They were actually the original inventor of the first digital camera. Kodak understood Photoshop, and they understood printing because they sold printers that printed beautiful color images. Kodak understood the web. By 2007, anybody who was in technology clearly knew the importance of the World Wide Web. And Kodak's CEO at the time actually came from Motorola, and he understood uh, wireless communications. And it was in 2007 that we were just changing in the United States from 2G, text only, to 3G, which meant the ability to actually send images, even including photographs. So Kodak had a lot of the facts of what was going on in technology but they were very focused on one thing, and that was the marketing war with Walmart over the single-use film camera. What was going on at Apple in 2007? The iPod was seven years old. Steve Jobs looked at the same facts that Kodak looked at. He understood digital photography because Apple had introduced its own digital camera some years earlier. Uh, he understood 3G. Uh, he understood the World Wide Web. He understood the fact you could put services on top of a product like the iPod and give people uh, a thousand songs in their pocket, as he would describe it. But the difference was Steve Jobs zoomed out, and he connected the dots, and he saw the relevance between each of these events, the same facts that Kodak had. He saw the facts in a different way, and that was zooming out. We live in an era of urgency. The speed of adoption is amazingly fast. In June of 2016, no one had heard of Pokemon Go. Within 30 days, by the middle of July, on one day, more people downloaded Pokemon Go than Twitter. It didn't exist 30 days earlier. It was a phenomenon. So how do you explain that? You cannot explain it with linear thinking. Kodak saw the world through the perspective of linear thinking. You can only understand a phenomenon where something goes from unheard of to exceeding the popularity of one of the most famous uh, applications in the world in 30 days by thinking of it exponentially, not just from a linear perspective. So we have this interesting dichotomy we're in the era of urgency. 
where exponential growth technologies are creating some amazing opportunities. At the same time, because they are growing so fast, these exponential technologies are commoditizing faster than others. So you see some of the most famous consumer electronics companies in the world you know, came out with amazing smartphones, and yet many of those companies discovered that they were hemorrhaging losses, hundreds of millions of dollars of losses, with very good products because these exponential technologies were commoditizing so quickly. The context I want you to think about is the reinvention of work. And we'll think about the reinvention of work from the perspective that what used to take 10 years to get done, now we expect to get that done in maybe three years. What used to take three years to get done, today we expect that to get done in three months. And we need to think about the traditional way of working. Everyone here is familiar with a business plan. It's really largely looking back from where we came, usually the previous year, and then looking forward with the context of our experience from the previous year of how we budget the spend for the next year, a business plan process, understood all across the world. What does it include? It includes a skilled project teams of talented executives who know how to work uh, the various steps to build a business plan. It requires financial metrics, which have been understood for decades. Return on sales, sales growth, return on, on uh, assets, you know, profit ratios. You know, all of these traditional metrics that are understood by business people for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It includes, more recently, uh, technology, software as a service, which gives us uh, tools that are even more sophisticated to help in the business planning process. And each company has its own unique ways of describing its policies for its business processes. But that's the traditional way of working. And we're in an era of urgency. So we need to reinvent the way we work. That will allow us to get things done much faster, more productively, with better results. And so the reinvention of work doesn't start by looking back at last year and building the budget for the next year. It starts with the customer and says, what is it that we can do for the customer, particularly in a time when the new moonshot, this power shift from traditional organizations who have been leaders in many cases for many decades, to the power shifting to customers, the customer is now paying more attention to other customers' opinions. What is our customer plan? What is the big problem that we can solve for the customers? Let's not get distracted by the budget or what we did last year, but let's, for this exercise, only focus on what's in it for the customer. And now we look at what are the ways that we can build the customer plan. We can look at feedback loops. We have that kind of technical capability today. We have more and more data to work with. Hue is a brilliant advancement in terms of the types of capabilities that artificial intelligence enables one to build a customer plan. Chatbots. Messaging now exceeds the volume of social media. Chatbots are incredibly important as messaging takes on an even greater role in the way that companies do business. We have the on-demand workforce. You know, we heard earlier this morning that the ways that people work is that they have to work across organizations. You know, people are organized around the task that needs to be done, not just the functional organization chart of the company. And so this ability to have 
people on demand to work in project teams using data and artificial intelligence and things like chatbots and mobility and being able to look at the metrics for the customer plan that are quite different than the metrics for the business plan. A metric for a customer plan. How do we engage that customer? What is the cost of customer acquisition? What is the retention strategy and plan for that customer? How do we monetize that customer? What is the lifetime value of the customer? Every metric that I've mentioned is a customer-centric metric. And when you look at the world through the perspective of the exponential world, where everything is accelerating, as Ray Kurzweil said yesterday, it's the era of the law of accelerating returns, that you have a choice. Do you want to be Kodak and be constrained by a linear perspective of looking back? Or do you want to think about a customer plan in the context of exponential growth? We're in an era of not just the reinvention of work, but the reinvention of everything. We're in the era of urgency. Customers are in control. And so now, we must realize the seriousness of the situation that we must either adapt or we must face the possibility of disappearing. Thank you. Mr. Scully, thank you very much. From here, we would like to invite Mr. Makino as well on the stage so that he can have a discussion with Mr. Scully. So please wait for the setting. Now, Mr. Makino, please come up to the stage. Thank you very much for the wonderful speech. Now, I would like to serve as the facilitator for this discussion and so that we can follow up on things that, we were, not, that were not covered in the presentation and also um, now that uh, we have this golden opportunity to invite you on this uh, stage, we have so many questions. So we received many questions from the audience on behalf. So we would like to uh, cover these questions uh, through this session. Now, without further ado, I would like to come start with this question. This is a must question regarding, uh, I think you've seen the uh, demonstration of Hue. What's your impression about Hue? Can you sh uh, begin with that uh, question first? I'm very impressed with Hugh. Uh, I'm particularly impressed that uh, Works Application has taken the initiative of what I believe is a fundamental change in computing world, that for the, all of the decades that I've been involved with high tech, going back to those early days in Silicon Valley, every high tech company has focused on building tools. And this is the first example where a company at the enterprise resource planning level has said it is going to be more than tools in the age of artificial intelligence. It's going to be the age of virtual personal assistance. And the demonstrations that you gave today and the demonstrations that were given yesterday, Akimo san were very impressive about what Hue will enable organizations to have a virtual personal assistant that goes beyond a tool. Thank you very much. I was very much encouraged with that statement. Mr. Scully just uh, uh, arrived in Japan yesterday, so he uh, was kind enough uh, to hear the presentation and Hugh, I think I thought he was quite curious about Hugh. 
So the next question, I would like to talk about your recent activities, Mr. Scully. In the presentation, you mentioned that the sense of urgency and customer in control, those kind of concepts uh, are now the centerpiece of the value uh, proposition. That's what you mentioned in the presentation. But in your business, in the space that you're active, uh, can you share with us uh, in what space you are active right now? I uh, help entrepreneurs build. I can only do it. My wife and I work uh, together. She's a computer scientist and a, a data scientist. And we work with a small number of what we believe are going to be potentially very, very successful uh, private companies. And one of them happens to be in the healthcare industry in the United States. Three trillion dollar industry spend per year in the US. Uh, unsustainable going forward. No one has figured out how the US will be able to pay for it. And the challenge is we still don't have everybody covered with health insurance and our population is aging. So we'll have more and more chronic care patients. The chronic care patients uh, represent 50% uh, of the health care spend. The pharmaceuticals and medication therapy management represents $800 billion a year. And the problem that we're focused on at our company called RX Advance is we are helping the insurance companies in the health industry and the large hospital systems take the chronically ill patients from the hospital beds, move them to their own homes, this is an initiative of the health uh, leaders, and we're enabling it with our company, RX Advance, that we can take literally billions of dollars of cost savings out of serving the chronically ill patients and medication therapy management. We launched our, we started the company in 2013. Uh, we launched our uh, first uh, service in January of this year. We'll do about 80 million revenue this year. We're forecasting 500 million revenue next year. We're forecasting $10 billion of revenue by 2020. And that just gives you a real example that you can take big customer problems and you can build uh, new disruptive companies that can go in and solve that problems. And if you do it well, these businesses can grow at an extraordinary size very quickly. I have another question related to that. Looking at your recent activities, and also what you did for Pepsi and Apple Computer as a CEO, what would happen in Japan um, after serving as CEO of Pepsi and or Apple, many people will consider retirement. I think that's a typical pattern in Japan, but uh, that's not what you did. You started something completely new as an adaptive innovator or helping identify adaptive innovator or maybe making the world a better place. I don't know what your motivation was, but anyway, you decided to start something completely new and start new businesses. Why did you make the decision? I'm um, older than 50. I have to think about my next step, so please help me. I thought about how lucky I have been in life. I have had the opportunity to work with some of the most brilliant people in the world, work on some of the most interesting uh, businesses. And I've been doing it uh, as an entrepreneur since I left Apple, uh, helping start a number of companies. In, in, um, we built one of the, the largest wireless uh, operator businesses in the US, up to $9 billion. We've built all kinds of other companies. And I said, I want to be able to pass on the lessons that I've been so fortunate to learn. And I want to be able to talk to my peers, the other entrepreneurs, and say, what are the lessons you learned? And so I wrote a book called Moonshot, that's now in Japanese, and it's all about, the it's not an autobiography, it's the lessons many of us coming out of Silicon Valley learn that we think can be useful to the next generation of entrepreneurs who want to build their businesses. Because as we know, it's still very, very early days in things like artificial intelligence and nanotechnologies and precision medicine and all of the ways in which uh, the world can change in pos positive ways. So 
my wife Diane and I uh, said, uh, for us, we're not interested in lying on the beach. Uh, we'd much prefer to go and meet with young people. We're out at the major uh, technical universities, um, and it's a, a great way of life. Thank you. Next question. Technology is um, showing exponential growth, but I don't think this is limited to technology. Business is also developing, advancing exponentially. So instead of 10 years, three years, instead of uh, three years, maybe three months, so that time is shortening, definitely. So when we think about the exponential growth and uh, considering that uh, it will only accelerate, uh, what kind of thing we will, s will we see in terms of technology? Well, I think that we're going to see it touch every industry in the world. Um, I'm leaving for the States this afternoon, and my wife Diane and I are headed to the X Prize in California, uh, where there are nine teams competing on major uh, world-changing issues, such as uh, finding a solution that is a non-fossil fuel energy source, uh, finding ways to build low-cost uh, housing for some three billion people who have no shelter at night, finding ways to come up with drinkable water. There are over three and a half billion people who drink dirty water. So these are amazing uh, challenges, and they're young teams, and they've been working on it for the past nine months, and they have uh, advisors like us who will be meeting with them all weekend long uh, to help uh, give them our perspective on the challenges they're taking on the way. But none of those things would be possible that they're working on without these exponential technologies. So it goes way beyond uh, just what happens in a particular industry like high tech. It's going to touch everything in, in the world of the future. I see. Thank you. Now, in your book, of uh, Moonshot. I'm sure that many people in the audience have read your book. And uh, yesterday, in fact, uh, we heard from many people. And um, they all said that uh, Moonshot is probably one of the best books uh, coming out in the last few years. Now, what kind of people or companies can generate Moonshot and uh, innovation? That's my next question. Well, I think about what I describe in Moonshot as adaptive innovators. Many people think that what Charles Darwin said when he uh, created the theory of evolution was that it was the survival of the fittest. If you look carefully, you'll see he never actually said that. What he actually said was that those species that are able to adapt to their changing environment are the ones that will survive. So the word adaptive is incredibly important because we are faced with challenges, but we're also faced with amazing opportunities. So what I describe in my book, Moonshot, is how do you take people who may not be Steve Jobs, may not be Elon Musk, may not be Larry Page or Jeff Bezos, who are the true disruptive innovators, but they may be people who want to participate in their own companies, or they may want to participate in some newer companies, not actually be the founder. And how do they play a role in terms of their own contributions to be able to help adapt innovation and to be able to lead change? And the customer plan, the zooming techniques, these are just some of the things that uh, I describe, which are incredibly powerful for adaptive innovators. Well, earlier, you were talking about um, zooming out. And uh, this is a very appropriate concept. If you zoom out from the existing uh, framework, maybe there are many opportunities left still where we can transform and innovate. And the companies who can identify those first can be the innovative company. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, I think the important thing 
is that it's easy to get caught up in thinking that it's all about technology. Actually, it's more about domain expertise. Uh, for example, uh, traditionally, Silicon Valley uh, has not been big investors into healthcare technology because healthcare industry has a special domain expertise in the US that is very complicated. It's shaped by politicians, by lobbyists, by all kinds of regulations, and Silicon Valley investors typically say, well, why would I go into an industry so complex with all of that unique domain expertise when I can go and you know, help the next startup with uh, social media or something, e-commerce? You go into the healthcare industry, they have the domain expertise, but they don't understand the high technology because the healthcare industry in the US is uh, traditionally over a decade or more, sometimes several decades, behind other industries that have been late adopters. And now we're seeing that a lot of the future of healthcare is about the consumer, the patient taking on greater responsibility. Remember, customers in control or patients in control. And so finding those three vectors of understanding high technology and its capabilities in an exponential context, understanding domain expertise in your respective industry. I used healthcare as just a particular example. And then the third vector of the shift to power to customers and who are really consumers, having those three domains is what I focus on because I've worked in each of those domains. There are many people here in the audience, I suspect, who have experience in multiple domains. It's all about multiple domains because domains are in motion and as domains touch, that's where innovation opportunity occurs. Okay, thank you very much. I understood very well. Now the next question. I think you touched upon this in your presentation and also you touched about this uh, in your uh, in the statement that you just made, but this is a question that many people ask, ask me to ask you. So uh, was Mr. Jobs an adaptive innovator in the moonshot? The, uh, was he the adaptive innovator that you described in your book? And what about Apple? Is Apple going to uh, continue driving adaptive innovation after Mr. Jobs uh, has passed? Can you uh, share with us based on some concrete example? Steve Jobs was one of those truly exceptional geniuses uh, who was more than an adaptive innovator. He was a disruptive innovator. As he used to say to me, he said, I want to make a dent in the universe. You know, he was willing to commit his life to making a dent in the universe, to literally change the physics. Uh, we used to call it the Steve Jobs reality distortion effect because he didn't felt bound by the laws of physics. And he was unique. Uh, you can see another generation of people who share that kind of disruptive uh, talent. You know, Elon Musk does, and uh, maybe Jeff Bezos, and maybe Larry Page, and, and maybe Mark Zuckerberg. These are uh, people who are far more talented th than I am. I'm an adaptive innovator. I'm pragmatic. So I look at these geniuses and say, look how they think about the world. We saw one yesterday with Dr. Ray Kurzweil. Uh, he's one of those tr true disruptive innovators. And he explained to us singularity and explained to us how he could predict with some accuracy uh, what was going to happen, what had already happened. So I pay attention to those geniuses and say, okay, how can we adapt what we learn from them, from their moonshots, how can we adapt and apply it to the pragmatic, practical uh, opportunities that we have? So I'm an adaptive innovator, not a disruptive innovator. And many of you in this audience uh, have the potential to be adaptive innovators too. You may already be adaptive innovators. Well, in that case, then the next question, the Apple computer today, is has that become an adaptive innovator? How, were they able to become an ad adaptive in innovator, Apple computer? Defined uh, what its principles were back in the early days when Steve Jobs and I worked together. 
Apple is an extension of Steve Jobs. It's, it's impossible to uh, separate the two. And so the uh, principles of what Apple is today are the principles that Steve Jobs created back in those early days when we were together. And one of the principles was we don't have to be the first, but we need to be the best. We must have no compromises. Uh, Apple believed that the, the user experience, the fit and finish, the materials, everything had to be perfect. And I think that the current leadership, Tim Cook and the others, have done an excellent job of continuing to follow that inspirational uh, principle that Steve Jobs had. The reality is that Apple has tremendous future ahead of it um, because the loyalty of iPhone users is beyond any other product in technology. Uh, it is a product that they've sold over a billion iPhones in total. There are over 300 uh, million people who regularly use an iPhone. And so when Apple introduces a major new uh, innovation, and I suspect that 2017, I have no inside information about what's going on in Apple, but uh, I just know that so many people admire Steve Jobs that I'm sure for the 10th anniversary of his creation of the original iPhone, that I'm sure there are high expectations that Apple will do something spectacular with the iPhone in, in 2017. And just the refresh cycle of that you know, is going to continue to propel Apple to be very, very successful. OK, thank you very much. This again is also a very tough issue on us. Actually, the innovative companies like the Googles or Apple have not emerged out of Japan for decades now. Of course, back in the uh, past, there were uh, many uh, innovative people in Japan, like uh, Sony, for example, which was a company very much funded by Mr. Steve Jobs. There were so many venture company companies back then. But uh, over the last several decades, we haven't seen so many innovative companies arising out of Japan, like Google or Apple. What's the reason behind this? Do you see any reason why we haven't been able to see any innovative com companies com coming out of Japan? Or are there any advice from you in order to nurture such companies? First, let me say that uh, there was no one that Steve Jobs admired more. And I've made over 30 trips to Japan uh, that I was also inspired by than Akio Morita. Morita-san, uh, as you know, created the first transistor radio. He created the first Walkman. And uh, I remember when Marita San gave Steve Jobs and I each one of the first Walkman off the uh, production line. It hadn't even come to the market yet. And when Steve and I got on the plane and we started heading back, and he said, give me your Walkman. I said, what do you mean? He said, I want it. He said, we're going to take these two products apart because we've got to learn from Sony. They are the best. And he always admired Sony. Most of what the Macintosh was in the early days was made from Sony components. So Japan does not lack from any talent. It's not a talent issue. I think it may be a context issue, because when you are in the world of a traditional linear economy, and the days of the Walkman was a traditional linear economy, it was pretty predictable on how its growth would be. Today, we're in this exponential growth economy. It's one where there are huge advantages that Silicon Valley has over other places in the world. Why? Because we are an immigrant collection of talents from all over the world, different cultures, uh, people coming from different backgrounds and experience. Whereas Japan is, is a very uh, singular culture and dominated by a very singular culture. So I think the examples uh, are here, but they aren't as many. For example, uh, Uniglo is a very, very respected, innovative company. They started as a material science company in Japan maybe 35 years ago. Today, they make uh, very high quality uh, apparel at very affordable prices. And the two most popular stores on Fifth Avenue are the Apple Store and the Uniglo Store. So. It's an, an example of how material science went into apparel, went into design, and became very successful. Uh, if you take uh, Masa Sun, uh, I've known Sun San since he was a programmer and sat in a little cubicle back in uh, 1986. Uh, and 
he is a disruptive innovator. So he has many of the similar characteristics of the people we talked about in Silicon Valley. So we need more and more examples of that. And I think that it is more challenging in Japan because uh, it is a singular culture uh, as opposed to what we have in Silicon Valley where it's many, many cultures that, that are mixing with each other. So I, I would expect that uh, we'll see more role models of success in, in Japan than, than we have in recent years because there's great talent here in Japan. Thank you very much. Next, um, Japanese companies. There are so many traditional companies with long history, and I think, I think the same applies to North America too. But when it comes to typical Japanese companies, they have long histories. And these companies are struggling in driving innovation. And that may be part of the reason why the economy is stagnant in Japan at this point of time. So in order to drive innovation, moonshot may be needed for these companies that have a history of more than 100 years. For these companies, in order for them to drive moonshot kind of innovation, can you give us some advice for them to drive innovation? I can give you some observations. And I would be, um, I think, embarrassed to say it's true advice because I don't know enough in, 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 the, in the tale about um, everything that's happening in Japan. But here's what I would, would say as an observer who has been coming to Japan uh, since the early 1980s. In this country, you have a singular culture that shapes uh, the marketplace, the business uh, environment, but you also have two religions. You have Shintoism, which is a religion that focuses on living, and you have Buddhism that focuses on the afterlife, and yet they coexist. And my observation would be that if you think of the concept of parallel universes, so you have parallel universes in your uh, ability to accept two different religions simultaneously. I don't know of any other culture that does that, so it's very, very interesting. And yet, we have, on the one hand, the traditional linear universe, of which Japan is, has a great history, companies going back over 100 years old, and then you have the exponential parallel universe. And so I think for Japan that the leaders who want to be adaptive innovators have got to coexist in both. You have to coexist in to use my earlier example in the, in the presentation, the business plan model is more in the traditional sense. It's easily understood by everyone here. I'm not, I imagine everybody looked at that and said, well, of course, that's the way we do it. I suspect when I showed you the customer plan and talked about the parallel exponential universe that you said, hmm, that's interesting. And then you saw Hugh and you, you're interested in artificial intelligence and respect work applications that, yeah, there's something happening here. You've got to coexist in both. In other words, you've got to adapt. That's why the word adaptive is so fundamental. And I think that uh, if you become adapters and you can say, what's the best of both worlds? And how do we not miss mm. the exponential? One last observation on that. In 2007, Kodak was living in the linear uh, universe. And so they said, well, of course, digital photography will become important someday. And they didn't realize, as Ray Kurzweil pointed out yesterday, that, and he used the example, that if it took you a year to do 1% of a task, that it would take you 100 years to do 100% of the task, if you looked at it from a linear perspective. But if you looked at that from an exponential perspective, he said, and you did 1% of the task in the first year, it would only take seven years to get to 100%, because in the exponential model, things are doubling every year. And 
I think that's what caught Kodak by surprise. And three years later, after the iPhone came out, they were bankrupt. So it's not that I'm forecasting bankruptcy of companies in, in, in Japan, but the reality is the economy has been stagnant for 20 years, and yet you have tremendous talent here. Uh, so I think that my encouragement would be think about how you can balance one foot in the linear universe, one foot in the exponential universe, and how they can coexist and you can become an adaptive innovator. Yeah. I completely agree with your assessment. Exponential universe was uh, limited to high technology, high technology in the past, but now it's no longer limited. It goes into so many different um, domains or areas, so Japanese companies will have to understand that. As you mentioned earlier, zooming out is uh, important. So they have to have a wider perspective, including uh, many factors and domains, and put the customer in the center, and uh, identify exponential opportunities on one hand, and on the other hand, think about how to grow existing business. They have to do both, definitely, right? Absolutely, and it can work in any industry. Uh, you gave examples yesterday of the construction industry. You talked about universities today. Uh, you could go into the retail industry. You could go into any business-to-business uh, -business industry. In other words, uh, the ideas that you outlined so clearly with you and what your vision is for work applications literally can touch every industry. It's not limited just to a certain kind of business. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. This is going to be my last question to you. I know that uh, there are many people in Japan who want to be entrepreneurs, and uh, also people who are pursuing innovation within existing companies. But in Japan, there are not many people who can grow exponentially and uh, not even linearly. Can you give an um, encouraging message to those people who want to start new companies or stay in the same company but still want to bring innovation into their organizations? Well, here's the challenge, and I suspect it is a similar one here in Japan. It certainly is true in the United States, that as organizations get large, that middle management, several layers of middle management, are given a, an authority. And it's the same authority regardless of what the company is or what the industry is. It's the authority to say no, not the authority to say yes. And why is that? Well, the reason is that uh, most large organizations have as their first motivation is to protect being large. You know, they don't want to end up like Kodak did. So the first instinct of the middle managers uh, is to take the authority that they have to say no and say, no, we cannot do that because of some policy or some, some practice or we don't have enough budget. The reality is that innovation normally occurs, you know, in newer companies because they can solve problems in ways without the baggage of an organization that is told to say no. And so I think it's important for Japan that you have more and more uh, entrepreneurial companies. And I don't know the mechanisms for how they get capital or how they could spin out, or in some cases it could be done in a sponsorship from the large organizations. But the reality is I've spent more of my working lifetime as an entrepreneur than I have as a CEO of a large corporation. And so I am very familiar with what it takes for these entrepreneurs to meet the challenges. And the first thing is curiosity. You have to have a curiosity. You know, even at my age, I have insatiable curiosity. Then you have to have a passion. 
and you have to believe in it. I'm sure when you created work applications, you had a passion that you could do something, and look what uh, you and your partners have created. And you have to have a passion because you've got to motivate other people to want to participate with you and be on your team. Now, you can do this within an established corporation. You don't have to necessarily leave your corporation, but you've got to negotiate a permission to be able to take risks, to try new things, to you know, get the opportunity to be an innovator even within your own organization. That sponsorship from senior management is going to be critical for adaptive innovation to take place in the large established companies. Your answer is making so much sense. And uh, many companies, organizations have to consider this. Startups with um, founders like myself, um, it's true, our middle management don't say no to suggestions because all the suggestions need to be done, they need to be implemented, executed. So everybody's like, okay, how can we do this? But I do agree, if the organization is larger or older, maybe the top management is very motivated to innovate, but the middle management and the maybe slightly uh, lower upper management are more likely to say no to these uh, innovations. So how can we remove this layer of no and uh, nurture a positive culture and that way, you don't have to do a startup. Even within a large organization, you can generate innovation. Do you agree? The challenge is that many companies that may be over 100 years old, there's no employee who has ever met the founder. <laughs> <laughs> and as you know, because you are a founder, uh, that people look to a founder as being someone special uh, because they founded the company. So uh, it is a harder challenge for a company where there is no founder living uh, than it is for companies where there is still a founder alive, even if they're not active in, in the uh, business. So I think it's a question of getting role models. So particularly for the companies where founders are no longer alive, you know, they need to be able to have, the management can point to role models of other companies that, that are doing it so that people get confidence. It's building confidence. As you have uh, said, uh, this is a country where consensus takes place before execution. Well, I think it's the job of leadership in the company to build consensus around innovation, not just consensus around you know, a particular product. Okay, thank you. We would love to hear more from Mr. Scully, but uh, we unfortunately have run out of time. Thank you very much once again for your precious inputs. It was quite informative. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful speech that we heard today. Thank you. Thank you very much once again. Okay, once again, thank you very much. I think uh, you, this brought lots of insight to you, so we at work applications. We would like to help you drive innovation, cause innovation. With this, we would like to finish the morning session. And we look forward to seeing uh, you again in the afternoon because we have prepared many different uh, lectures in the afternoon. Once again, thank you very much for being with us. <laughs>